Should we start? Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's Cindy and Christine at Candles and Supplies. And today we have a really special session. So we're doing, we're not making anything for you, but we're doing a candle mm -hmm. Q&A. So just want to do a sound check in, um, make sure everybody can see us and hear us and stuff like that. Say hi if you're out there. If you have any questions, post them in there. We had a bunch of people that emailed this morning some questions, really, really, really good ones. So we're super excited to do this and everything. So yeah, if you're out there, let us know, um, post your questions, and that way we can get them answered before the end of the live and stuff. So. Yeah, sounds good. So we're going to go through our questions first that we got submitted and um, the ones on Instagram, Great. and then post any questions you have as we go, and then hopefully we can get to those yeah, towards the end. Sounds good. So we both been making that. candles probably about the same amount of time because it was it was somebody's idea to make candles when she was a little kid. And I'm like, <laughs> sure, sounds like a great idea. Let's make candles. And we both read through the same frustrations that you guys do, you know, make candles if you turn out great, if you don't turn out great, this happened, that happened, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, but since then, uh, we've had the pleasure of being able to play with all kinds of different supplies and different opportunities and teach classes and and do lots of contract work and stuff like that so to help us work through all those things and stuff like that too so we want to help you guys out wherever you're stuck whatever you're having trouble with whatever your pain points are whatever put in here we hope to get to that today um and then hopefully i mean there's some really good questions that people send in and everything so hopefully uh you know you may have these questions and you didn't even think of them but we will cover them today for you too so all right i'm seeing lots of highs and everything so i think that people somebody says they have no sound uh okay all right are you getting that you have no sense? sound just one person says no sound if anybody else has no sound posted in there make sure your volume's turned up that way you'll be able to hear us too. So, all right, yeah. Okay, yeah, check your volume on your phone. Looks like other people are hearing us just fine and stuff like that. So, but yeah, check your volume and anyway. All right. All right. What do we have first? Here we go. So, um, start off with one that doesn't really, there's a lot that kind of intersect a bit. So right. I kind of group those a little bit together, but so let's start with one that doesn't intersect with anything else. Um, so proud marine mom on Instagram um, wants to know when selling candles outside under the canopy, what is the best way to stop them from melting? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> we have people all over the country and stuff like that. And especially like container candles, anything in a jar uses a low melt point wax. Um, and sometimes they can, they can get a little, little juicy in there. Best thing to do if you have electric, bring a fan just a fan blowing on your candles and moving some air that will help definitely make sure that they're out of the sunlight um you know that that sunlight is is deadly not only for color but for melting and everything too but just a little displacement of the air so a fan it, even if you have a battery fan or whatever to put it on the table just just to kind of get the air moving around your candles will help them to not melt as easily mm -hmm. um obviously if you live in phoenix and you're selling outdoors that's going to be hot they may come pre-melted or anything but you know up yeah. here in the northeast and stuff like that it gets hot could but, you put some like bring coolers and put some in coolers you could probably do that too if you're really ambitious put some in coolers and stuff yeah. so i mean just you could just have your display ones out mm -hmm. and then have some mm -hmm. maybe there yeah just usually like a little bit of air displacement um you'd be amazed at how that could work I, we had a in our other location, we had a very small carving room to do our carved candles. Like it was pretty much the size of a closet, you know, not even a walk-in closet, a closet. And we carved candles in there and it also didn't have great air conditioning. So I was doing a carving class. I'm like, I'm just going to plug a fan in because we're going to die. We're all going to die in this room. So I plugged the fan in and it cooled off that wax so fast that we couldn't even carve a candle in like two or three minutes. So just that little bit of air, even though it was like over a hundred degrees in there really helped with cooling the candles. So um, that's my best thing. And besides, if you have a fan at a hot crab show event, it'll draw people in. Be like, can I stand under your fan? Yeah, come on in. It's not the too. So, <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's helpful. All right, All right. What's next? So, the next one is from Lisa, which will kind of tie into some of our other ones. Um, mm -hmm. How do I prevent the wax from melting only in the center of the candle? Okay, so that's called tunneling. I have a good example of that. So, candle tunneling is when your candle burns just down in the middle um, and doesn't burn around to the outside. So let's talk a little bit about wicks. We did get a lot of questions on wicks and that's always probably the most confusing part of making candles. Well, I mean, you could just say, 
just before I get too much into the wick thing, because I yeah. have other questions on that, that okay. it's the wick size. That's why it's right. tunneling. Yeah, it's tunneling. It's not big enough of a wick. It's not, yeah. it's not burning hot enough to go all the way out to the edges. So you'll need a bigger size wick. No. Bigger wick will do it. <laughs> all right. And then um, that leads into the other ones. Yes. So how do I determine the wick size to use for what size jar? Ah, perfect. So, so when you're deciding, so this question goes into another one. When you're deciding what wick to use, what you want to do is just measure the width of your jar. So you just want to put a ruler. Oh, that's upside down. It's probably backwards on your screen too. <laughs> so you want to measure the diameter of your jar. It all goes by the diameter. So you need a wick that's hot enough to burn the full diameter, but you don't want one that's going to be too hot and burn, you know, or get a nice too big of a milk hole. So you want to measure the diameter of the candle. So put a ruler on it, measure the diameter of this one, the inside diameter. So if, you're, if your jar is thick, you want to go inside to inside. And that's the amount of wax that you're going to need to melt, right? Um, so once you determine that, you can look at the wick charts for any of the particular wicks and be like, okay, this candle is two and two and three eighths inch wide. So you look at the wick charts and you pick a wick size that's for two and three eighths and you choose right. there. So you have to know what wax you're using as well. Reach the wax is true differently. So whatever the wick, our wick chart has the wax and then the size of diameter. So you find your wax and then find the size mm -hmm. that you'd be there. And then there's usually a couple ones there because they are yeah. there a little so bit. So there's a couple options. So if you like CD wicks or paper core wicks or wooden wicks or whatever you like, there's options there for each one. And sometimes there's even, you know, size options. So the wick chart will read like maybe it reads, you know, two to three inches diameter or two and a half this doesn't fall in the two and a half because it's two and three eighths but say you have a two and a half inch candle there's two sections in there for one for two to th two to three inches and one for two and a half to three and a half so one's going to be a hotter option so if you you know you pick one for you know a two and a half inch candle and you're still getting tunneling like this and you know you have to go water pick with the hotter option if you have a very easy burning wax like say you have a traditional wax it's very easy easy burning and stuff like that you may go with the cooler option um, you always want to go as cool as possible and still get the melt pool because then you'll get a longer burn. If you go too hot and get a you know a big you can have a big flame, you could have soot. Doesn't matter what kind of wax you're using. If you have too big of a wick in there and it's going to soot, then you don't want that. You know you can't say like any plant wax won't soot. Right. Um, but we also have options. Yeah, also the different options too. Some fragrance oils burn a little harder than others, so you want to test it per fragrance oil. Um, for some, we might need an up or down size wick on that. That comes into play a lot. So true, true. But this is a good. The, the wick charts are a good general starting point. Mm -hmm. So I'd start there. Text bring your candle and make sure everything looks good. Um, but usually, you, if you have to change it, it's usually up or down one size from there. One size from there. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty. We did a lot of testing to get those, and these are all with our waxes and our fragrances. So you get them somewhere else, and I can't help you. Yeah, because <laughs> I get that question sometimes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. some other companies' fragrance oils might burn a lot differently than ours. Mm -hmm. So you have to talk to them because <laughs> I can't help because yeah. that's we didn't test it. Generally, so. with wicks, though, the job of a wick is to draw the wax up into the flame because you need flame and right. you need air to fuel and air to keep a candle burning. So if it's not drawing enough up into you know the flame, it's going to tunnel down. If it's drawing too much, it's going to be a big giant flame and too much. Too much soot and stuff like that so think about that if it's you know if it's uh it's it's a straw drawing the wax up into the flame so all right and adjust from there so all kind right. of on these same lines um from i can have a voice on instagram uh best ways to do wick testing oh great great question so when you're testing your wicks first i would recommend just putting the wax that you're using no color no scent or anything put the wax that you're using in the jar Right. And you get a basic wick size, get the perfect burn in there, get a basic wick size. Usually. So like if I'm testing this jar, I'll put wax in there. I, I usually only fill them halfway, too, because as the candle burns down, it burns down hotter when it's halfway. So I start at halfway um, and start burning from there. Um, so just the wax and just the wick. Test burn that. See how you like it. Um, if you need to adjust or anything, you don't have to waste a lot of jars. You don't have to waste a lot of wax. You can just put this either in your oven at like 160 to melt the wax out. Or you could, you know, put it on a griddle. I have a pancake griddle, so I'll just set that at a low temperature, put this on there, melt the wax, pull the old wick out, put a new wick in, let it harden, and retest burn. Um, so literally, you're using the same candles all the time for test burning. So, so first, get the, the jar, the wax, and the wick right. 
and then you can kind of adjust from there because like Christine was saying like some fragrance oils burn hotter than or hotter and some burn cooler than others so like you know uh, usually citruses burn a little easier than like a patchouli or a blackberry or something like that sometimes it has a lot to do with the fragrance weight so when you get fragrance and it, it gets weighed in the bottle it's done by you know weight not volume a lot of times the real thick ones um, the ones where your bottle's only like two thirds full and you think you got ripped off, but really it's that <laughs> it's that it. amount of ounces in weight, not volume. Um, a lot of times those are just stronger burners just because they're they're very thick scents, very, very thick, very viscous scents. Um, so once you get your wax and your wick right in the candle, then test burn with your fragrances. Um, fill the jar halfway because like I said, it burns hotter once it gets halfway. So even if you know you have it full and it's it's burning at first and tunneling down a little, a lot of times once the candle burns down to the center, it gets hotter. Um, the danger would be I'd rather see it tunnel a little bit at first and then everything melt in than have too hot of a wick. And then when it gets to the end, you have a very big flame and it's a fire hazard. You don't want that because the jar could pop. Um, if you're using a soy wax too for your wicks testing, I would wait, you know, I'd let it cure for like two weeks, not just for initial like wax and wick testing, that'll be fine initially, but for your scent testing. Um, soy waxes take, you know, a full two weeks to cure. So that means make the candle, put the lid on, let it sit for two weeks. If you're using a soy coconut, you don't have to, you know, worry about that. If you're using a more traditional wax, you know, with paraffin in it, stuff like that, you don't have to worry about that either. You can test burn within 24 hours. Um, so test burning procedures, just the wax and the wick in the jar, test burn that, get that perfect. And then you can test burn with your scents and color and everything for each one. All right. So move a little bit out of the wick area. Okay. Um, so from Steven, um, are heat, uh, heat and pouring temperatures really all that important? Um, can't we just get rough temperature range? Once you get to know the waxes, I would say yes. Um, at first, if you're just starting, I would take the temperatures just to, you know, just to know kind of where you're at and everything like that. And for the results, write everything down to record it. Um, but once you get to know the wax and know what it's doing, you know, after a few thousand candles on that, on that wax, you'll get a feel for it. Um, but a lot of times, depending on your candle making conditions, so like if your candle room is cool or particularly warm or has a lot of airflow going through it or, you know, this or that. So what works for you pouring at one temperature or whatever may not work for somebody else if they have different conditions. So if you have a very small room with no windows, it's going to be warmer in there. So you might have to pour at a different temperature than if you have a very big room and it's very aerated and stuff, you may have to pour at a different temperature. A lot of candle making problems like, you know, sinking and, and finish and stuff like that, um, you can actually fix by just adjusting your pouring temperature. So I would say, yes, heat is very important. It is very important too, when you heat your wax up and add your fragrance oil, you always wanna make sure your wax is nice and warm, like 180 degrees. Cause what happens as wax heats, it expands and the molecules get smaller. So by adding the fragrance oil when your wax is warmer, like at least 180 degrees, the scent molecules stick to all the wax molecules a whole lot better because they're smaller. So there's more room for it to get in there and everything. Um, if you've ever tried to like add fragrance, like a, I've read a lot of silly things out there that's like, put your fragrance in when your wax is 120, let it cool off. Well, when it's 120, the wax molecules are very big. You put your fragrance in, if you use it at, you know, a 10% ratio, you put your fragrance in, it's going to leach out, sit on the top. It's never going to bind with the wax. That's how you get so, scent pockets. That's how you get scent pockets. And that is a, a hazard, a, a burn hazard. So, so yes, temperatures are important, but once you get to know your wax and become best friends with it, work yeah. with it a lot and stuff like that. I, I don't know if it's as important. Yeah. It also depends a lot on the wax too. Like soy mm -hmm. wax and the soy coconut blends are a little trickier and have a little bit more to them. If like this pork mm -hmm. temperature makes a little bit more of a difference where if you have a paraffin or a paraffin blend and like you, as long as you put your fragrance in when it's hot, you can kind of pour it and it doesn't really matter as much mm -hmm. um, just with the way it cools. But if you're looking for a smoother top, I think that matters a whole lot more. With or if soy, you're fine yeah. with just fixing them, then Right. It doesn't matter right. Yeah, yeah, it depends on your candle pouring style. So some people yeah. like to pour whatever. If there's any problems at the end, they'll just fix it with the heat gun. So yeah, so it really depends a little on that. Okay. All right. So speaking of the wax temperature, um, how do you take an accurate uh, temperature reading of wax? I have a digital thermometer, and so I stick it in the hot wax for 10 seconds, and then use whatever it reads. Question mark. How long uh, do you leave the temperature in before you take the reading? 
Okay, that's an excellent question. So of course that depends on your thermometer, but first with any thermometer, make sure your wax is stirred up well, because whatever you're using for you know your, your wax heating or whatever, it's probably warm on the bottom or warm on the sides or whatever, maybe not in the middle. So make sure you stir it up well. And then, you know, for a digital thermometer, I would just leave it in long enough. You'll see it, you know, fluctuate and stuff like that. Once it stops fluctuating, that's good. So based on your digital thermometer, I feel like some take longer. I have two meat thermometers at home and stuff that I use. Usually I use um, just a point and shoot kind of thermometer here, but I have two meat thermometers at home. So when I'm cooking, I wait till it stops varying and stuff like that. But it could be on one of them, it takes like 30 seconds on the other one it's done varying in like three seconds so so it depends on your thermometer but once the the temperature stays stable that's good but make sure you start it up first before you take the temperature that way you know that it's all you know blended all together and it's one constant temperature all right so last one from steven um talk about failure rates um candle making is very discouraging i've had like an eight percent success rate okay well let's talk about failures a bit so one thing about candles is probably one of the only hobbies or crafts you can do where you can do reovers, redo it, so you can melt it again. So if it's a complete failure, just remelt it and repour it. Um, so that's one thing. I feel like there's not, you know, too much failure rate in candles. There is a learning curve, like with mm -hmm. anything. There's a learning curve, and you have to get to know your waxes. You have to get to know your scents and stuff like that, and, and what they do. So and what um, may be a failure to you may not actually be a failure. It may just be like adjust the pouring temperature, adjust the wick. You know, if your wick's too small or too hot or whatever, just melt it down, put a different wick in there, and you, you haven't failed at all. You've just learned. So I like to think of them more as learning experiences than complete failures. Um, I mean, a complete failure would be it doesn't burn at all. So, and then it's a wax melt, so it's not really a failure. You know? um, <laughs> yeah, but the wax, you have to keep in mind, you can remelt yeah. the wax and then pour it into a different candle. So, correct. You don't know. Correct. Yeah. So, it's important not to think of it as failures, it's just learning experiences, you know, move on. Okay, this pursues this result. Next time, if I don't want it to, I need to do this to fix it and stuff like that. So, but candles are never really failures because you can always melt them down and redo it. So, yeah. Everyone that's made that's successful at candle making now has remelted a lot of candles. So yeah, it just happens. And honestly, too, if you know what wax you're using, know what your jars are, and follow the whip chart, you're gonna get pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. they might just need to adjust a little bit here or there. So I think people would be like or are on those blogs and Facebook groups and everything. They're like, oh, well, yeah. they said to use this and this. Well, yeah, and I went for that person in like Canada with weird temperatures or whatever, but it might not work for you. And they might have for waxes right. and everything. So you just got, you really got to like follow the thing, follow everything and not listen to everybody's. Yeah. Be careful of trolls out there too. I've seen yeah. a lot of trolls on those boards that tell you to use things that blatantly will not work a hundred percent of the time. Like they're, I don't know if they're just having fun doing that. Just telling you to use, you know, put your shoelace in your candle in a tea light and that <laughs> should work. Not, not that ridiculous, but yeah. it, sometimes it is that ridiculous where, people give advice and it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? that's our, that's our work here. If you guys need a call or email or anything, cause yeah, like we're always here. it doesn't benefit us if you guys don't succeed because then you don't buy things. So that's right. we're here to help you. You're whereas successful, we're successful. a lot of those type of things may not necessarily be there to help you. Cause you're like, mm -hmm. Oh, if I tell this person the wrong thing and they won't sell candles and then I want a competition. Yeah. And just like, that's obviously yeah. not a good mindset. So. And this is one of those places where like, once you start working here, you get sucked in and you start making candles. So everybody here that's going to yeah. answer the phone has made candles and made a lot of them too so yeah because candle making is awesome yeah and then so. we've all gone through the the ups and downs mm -hmm. of making and with mm -hmm. new things and whatnot too so right there's a learning curve you're not gonna get right on the first time but right it will get you we'll get but you really learning. close and then we'll figure it out from there correct so. okay all right so patty said she had to change wax last year due to it being discontinued mm -hmm. uh now and when i pour candles i get a sinkhole in the middle as they cool Patty did not mention what wax she's using. So that's she re emailed me and Did she's she, using okay. 6006. So okay. she is using the IGI 6006, which is a soy paraffin blend. Excellent wax. We sell a lot of it and stuff like that, but it's not always a one pour wax. Um, so that's one thing about it that, you know, is, is a little frustrating that we see for people. It's not always a one pour wax. Um, again, if you adjust your pouring temperatures, knowing that wax expands as it heats up and shrinks as it cools, maybe you need to just pour a little cooler. So try adjusting your pour temperature by about 10 degrees and see if you get different results, um, with sinkholes and stuff. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. 
Um, but yeah, the 6006 is kind of known for that. So it does fix easily with a heat gun. So even if you do get a little sinkhole or whatever, just get a heat gun, heat the top of your candle and it'll fill that void right away. But I would try adjusting your pour temperatures because it's never fun to have to go back and redo your candles and stuff. So it's not that horrible, but it's just an extra step and extra time that you don't really want to take. So yeah, we're not back 25 years ago when every wax was yeah. had to repour yet. Early. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, so next question is from Briar. Mm -hmm. um, how big should a flame be? I've seen, I've been told a fourth of an inch, uh, but candles I bought from big uh, corporates are one or half an inch sometimes. I'm new to candle making and trying to figure out the size of the wick for each different size container. Mm -hmm. Good question. So if you get a very small wick, it's probably not hot enough again. So you need a, a bigger wick. That really depends on the wick. So if you're using wooden wicks, I find that they burn a little higher. Um, if you're using any kind of cord wick, I feel like the flame's a little bit higher too because you know it burns with a little bit of a mushroom. If you're using a cordless wick, sometimes it, it turns over, burns like that, and you, know, you won't get as high of a flame or a fibrate cotton wick or whatever. Basically, you want a high enough flame to burn the candle to get your full melt pool. You don't want the wick flame to be too high yeah, to if where it's you like get black soot and stuff the like jar, that. Yeah, not if, it's, if it's moving around <laughs> and dancing and you know throwing black soot, that's too bad. So, but it really depends. Like all the wicks burn a little bit differently, um, and the different sizes will burn differently too. So you want a nice flame. Like candlelight is very nice, especially when you light the candles. Like candlelight is you know part of the appeal of candles is just the the feeling that you get when a, a lit candle's there. So I would say you know a quarter inch is probably too small for me. I would like it to burn at like a half inch or you know about a half inch, yeah. just because I like the candlelight too. So yeah, I think it might depend a little bit too on the size of your candle. Mm -hmm. If you have a tea light, you don't want a half inch. That's a little That's aggressive. True. Good so point. if Good depending point. on how big the candle is, or a multi wick like candle, if you're doing a three wick candle, right. you probably don't want half inch no, flames on all too of them. So <laughs> yeah, so you want it to be a little smaller too. So depends on the candle. Um, so also from Briar is soy or coconut soy more clean burning. Also, is paraffin wax really bad for you? Um, what is in the toxic candles that everyone talks about? Okay, I love this question. Multiple this parts. is a great question. Okay, so, so we'll start with the first one: soy or coconut soy more clean burning? Both. It all depends yeah, on how you make the candle. So <laughs> all the waxes are clean burning if you make the candle correctly, because a candle shouldn't soot and smoke and stuff like that so um if you add too much fragrance oil that's going to make it soot and smoke um if you have too big of a wick that's going to make it soot and smoke so you can get the cleanest burning wax to soot and smoke i've never been able to get beeswax to, to soot and smoke i will say that but i haven't loaded it up with like 20 percent fragrance either and tried that probably, would probably burn. Yeah. that would probably make it smoke so any candle made properly um, will not soot and smoke look first to the wick because it's probably a wick problem or over fragrancing the candle if you get you know the toxins and stuff so um anything burning anything burning whether it be a candle anything is omits you know part of some type the there's there's emissions yeah that go in the air none of it is good for you it's not that bad for you um, yeah. but none of it's good for you. So anything's going to emit those toxins. So the people that say that, you know, beeswax will clean the air and not emit, no, anything burning is going to omit toxins, whether it be soy, paraffin, whatever. Um, there's been some studies like unconcluded studies, some people that, you know, are, are popular out there that are like, oh, paraffin super toxic and stuff like that. So, uh, it's not, it's no more toxic than anything else. So, um, I, it's not, and, and you know, you can read these things and they say this and that, but anything burning will throw toxins. You don't want to put your face over a burning candle. That should be on the label. Don't put your face over the burning candle. It's not good for you. You wouldn't do it anyway. It's hot. Not that much fun. So Yeah, and I think a lot um, of the, the toxic thing too actually goes back to the fragrance oils that weren't phthalate free. Correct. Um, again, the phthalates and everything went the air, but I mean... We're shipping then, all of our new fragrance are off LA free and we're shifting to off LA free. So like, I think true. that's a lot of the major thing right now. People talk about toxins in candles is like the phthalates. So I think a lot of what people talk about in toxins are the, the candles that you get from like the big box stores, like the one beginning with W and um, the ones where, you know, they're using imported fragrances from countries that have no fragrance regulations. We have a lot of fragrance regulations about what can be used in our fragrance oils here. So anything purchased in the U.S. is, is a lot more um, 
you know, toxin friendly than anything, you'll know. So once you start making candles, you become pretty much a snob. So try just for fun sometime if there's, you know, anything on sale that's super cheap, compare your candles, burn your candles, then burn one of those. I guarantee you'll get a headache within like three minutes if you burn something super cheap with, you know, things that aren't good for you in there. So it does cause headaches quicker. So, yeah. All right. Right here. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, last question from Briar. Is it safe to make candles in teacups, old metal, candy dishes, etc.? Things that you find in a secondhand store. This seems to be a trend right now, getting old dishes and glass dishes, cups, whatever. Um, we'll hold wax and making candles in them. Is this safe to sell? Excellent, excellent question. Um, varying up your containers and your vessels is super fun, super unique. It's a way to set your products as part. And yeah, it's awesome. I highly recommend it. Um, what I would check for, so keep in mind, especially if you're using things like depression wear glass and stuff like that, okay, this vessel's been around for like 50 years. Probably somebody along the way has dropped it, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe multiple times. You don't know. Um, anything that you would feel comfortable pouring boiling water into is safe to make candles in, right? So water boils at like 212 degrees. We're pouring wax anywhere from like, you know, 160 to 180 in there. So it's not even close to the temperature of, of boiling water. Um, and if you are kind of on the fence about it or whatever, like, is this going to hold boiling water? Try pouring boiling water into it. Usually things that are made for food, like teacups and stuff, have to, you know, they're they're designed to go through commercial dishwashers, which wash dishes at like 300 degrees, way, way, way higher than anything that we're using and stuff. But, you know, if you're on the fence, like, okay, you found cool teacups at a secondhand shop, um, just try, you know, boiling some water, pouring some boiling water in there and see how it holds up. So um, you may... It may break, um, probably not. It may break, and if it does, then it wasn't suitable for the candle anyway. So, uh, but yeah, definitely repurpose things and redo them again. That's a lot of fun. So you can find really unique stuff out there, which makes cool holiday gifts and everything. So yeah, uh, make sure you get your. The only thing tricky with that type of thing is the containers' size and shapes can vary, which can make breaking a little trickier. That's so, true. Mm -hmm. um, try not to hurt yourself looking for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so from Stephanie, how do I prevent cracking on top of a candle after you pour? Ah, great question. Cracking after you pour. Again, it could be pouring temperature. It could be, um, most of the time I find, unless you're using straight beeswax or whatever, just the cooling temperature. So again, with the fan, if you have a ceiling fan going in your candle room or something or any type of fan, um, a lot of times it'll cool the candle too quickly keeps it and it cools the outside surface of the candle. So actually when the molten wax on the inside is done cooling, it actually cracks on the outside because it cooled too quickly on the, on the end. So beware of fans, beware of air conditioners putting directly on it, that type of thing. So, and you can always adjust your pouring temperature. If you find like everything's fine, this and that, um, adjust your pouring temperature. Another thing I found is like, if you pour the candles and then just put a box over the top, just to kind of insulate it from any, you know, airflow or whatever, here when we pour like, you know, our um, production line and stuff like that, when we do like a thousand candles, it's out in our warehouse. So the ceilings are 20 foot high. It's getting the airflow from the entire warehouse. We'll actually, you know, cover the table up with boxes or whatever. So it doesn't get any unwanted airflow, um, any extra cooling that it doesn't need ahead of time. So, so you can try that putting a box over the top or alternating your pouring temperature. And then if all else fails, bring out the old heat gun, fill in those cracks at the end. So. Yeah. Some people put them in their oven to cool too, so it's true. Slower. So yeah, so again, that would be like the same type of thing. The same type of thing. Just mm -hmm. candles like to cool very slowly, very warm and very slowly. So yeah. all right. Also from Stephanie, how to test multiple multiple scents without wasting a lot of money? Ah, uh, good question. Back to the testing. So um, once you have your jar and your wick right. Um, you could test in a much smaller container. So just, you know, do something, um, you know, when you're testing for scents and stuff like that, when people buy candles, when your customers are buying your candles, they want to be able to light that candle up and literally within 10 to 15 minutes, they want a nice fragrance throw in the house and, and be able to smell it and everything. So um, when you're scent testing and everything, keep that in mind that as soon as you light it up, 10 to 15 minutes later, you should be smelling it nicely. If you're testing in smaller candles, like you can use, you know, smaller, like the maxi tea lights. I love, I love, love, love those four for scent testing. Are great too. Yeah. Little tins, two or four ounce tins or something like that. Keep in mind though, it's a small candle. So don't put it into like a giant 2000 square foot room and expect a scent throw. You know, it's that a smaller hurt. candle. 
<laughs> put it at your desk if you're working or, you know, a, a bedroom or something like that. I feel like a bathroom's too small unless you have a well, huge bathroom. A, yeah, a small candle. Um, yeah, so bathrooms are sometimes too small or closets or whatever. Cl closet. Yeah, um, but put it in, you know, a, a, a smaller room, like 10 by 10, 10 by 12, something like that. Burn it in there if you're using smaller sizes. So, and then, you know, you get whatever, 10, 15, 20 hours worth of burn time and stuff. So they also make nice sampler candles. So, um, but yeah, use a smaller, shallower candle. All right. Um, so also from Stephanie, um, how long to cure during the testing phase before doing a test burn? Uh, we use coconut soy wax, if that makes a difference. Okay. That I touched on a little bit before in test burning. So if you're using something that has a longer cure time, like just soy wax, you wait the full two weeks before scent testing with it. Um, if it's a coconut soy wax, usually those are pretty strong within, you know, at least 24 hours, um, at least 24 hours for everything. Give it a nice time to cool and for, you know, everything to bond together and marinate and that type of thing. But wait at least 24 hours, but it could be up to two weeks if you're using just straight soy. All right. Uh, do we need to separate pouring pictures for separate pouring pictures for our set? Good question. Nope, you do not. It's nice to have if you're going to be doing the same sense all the time and stuff like that. So that way you can just keep a picture, heat it up when you need it and pour it. Um, but you can clean it out in between each pour. Easiest way to clean out your wax pitchers is like after you pour your wax and the wax is hot, just take a couple paper towels and wipe it, wipe it out and go to your next one. They wipe out nice and clean. They do clean up very nicely and stuff like that in between pours. Even if you smell the pot and there's a little bit of residue, as long as you don't see any waxy residue in there, it's not going to carry into your next batch. So. Yeah. Because your next yeah. fragrance will overpower it anyway. So yeah, it you can work. always, like I said, you know, wax you can melt and remelt. So if, even if you have a little bit left over wax um, and it's tempting to keep it in the pitcher and have another one, just pour it into like an empty, you know, container that you would normally throw out, sour cream container or something like that, or gladware, you know, some type of plastic container and label it what it is. And then the next time you make that scent and color, you can just throw that in there and you've already got a head start on it. So, All right. Yeah. Let's start Instagram for questions. Okay. We'll go. go into Instagram for questions. See a lot popping up here, so you guys are doing great. All right. Will you email the wax scent chart? Ooh, that's actually on our site. So if you go to our site and go to candle making, candle wicks and wicking, it's right on there. Our wick chart is right on there. So if you'd like an email, you can send us an email and then we can send it over to you. But it is right on the chart where you can, or right on our website where you can download it. No. Oh. Um. Thank you for this. Some soy uh, makers will downplay paraffin makers. Customers don't really care. They just want a strong hot bro. Um, soy doesn't have that. Yeah, Correct. that's yeah. All wax have their benefits. So yeah. What about antique tins? Ooh, yes, yeah. definitely. As long as it'll hold water. If it's a tin with a seam at the bottom, sometimes I find those seams leak. Um, you can just take, you know, a glue gun and put a bead of glue around it. Um, yeah, um, bead of hot glue. So there, uh, China Doll is asking about uh, scent for wax. So um, each wax on there has about how much scent it should have on there, right? On our front. Right. So the, yeah, the different waxes have different fragrance loads and that's the amount of scent that can be put in there. Keep in mind, that's a maximum fragrance load. Um, a lot of our scents are really, really strong. So if it's something like say our espresso latte, for instance, you can smell that in the next town when we open the drum. It's so, it's so potent. So, but theoretically in some waxes, you can use, you know, 10 to 12% fragrance load. But if you put 10 to 12% of espresso latte, yeah, knock you're going you're gonna to <laughs> smell up three states away. So, so you may not need to use that many. Those are maximum recommended amounts in there. Yeah. And then some, you know, if it's a, a lighter kind of, um, a, a more subtle scent, a background scent, as we call it, you know, like butterfly kiss is very, very good, but it's more of a subtle scent. Um, people that are very sensitive, have very sensitive olfactory glands, you know, like things like that. Um, you know, you could use the maximum in there. So. Yeah, usually right around 8% and you're probably good. I'm a big fan of 6 to 8%. Yeah. And then, or lower. So keep yeah. in mind, fragrance is the most, you know, expensive part of the candle. Yeah. I would love to tell you to use 10% in everything because I'm telling you the fragrance, but um, use as much as you need for a nice scent throw. Um, so with the tins, do you have to put them in the oven to heat them up first? I don't believe so. I, I don't think you need to. So basically why people warm their jars is to get a better finish on the outside. 
um, for wet spots and everything. Tim, you can't see the outside. You can't see the outside, <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it. So uh, I wouldn't worry about that at all. No. All right. Let's go to Facebook and YouTube questions here. We got a lot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right. A lot of haze. All right. Why would somebody create a test candle without fragrance when fragrance heavily influences the burn? Great question. So creating a test candle without fragrance and at first make sure that you have the, the wax and the wick combination and that jar combination fine. You're not going to know if it's a harder burner or not or a lighter burner if you already put fragrance in it and stuff like that. So if you're making a lot of onesie twosies and stuff like that, obviously this doesn't apply. But if you have the same candle line, you use the same jars, the same wax all the time, um, you want to get that right first before putting yeah. the other one in. So, so it gives so you a good a baseline. So, exactly. Yeah. So if you're like, this yeah, is going to be my adjust. jar, mm -hmm. then you can definitely do it for that. If you're mm -hmm. varying around like it, with different right. fragrances, it wouldn't matter. But yeah. So if you use a fragrance that's kind of struggling to burn and stuff like that, but you know that the, the wax and the wick combination is correct, maybe you need to add a little coconut oil or, you know, a little Crisco to it to get it to burn a little easier, or, you know, maybe a little steric to get it to burn a little slower if it's a hotter burner. So, but that's a reason why you would create a test candle without fragrance in it. Um, and then you test your fragrance later. How can I get a chocolate brown? I have brown, but it comes out a dark maroon. Okay, good question. So our best chocolate brown, like Hershey's Bar chocolate brown, chocolate bar brown is our mocha liquid dye. Um, that makes the, the best chocolate chocolate color. And I go a little heavy on it. I go usually like six to seven drops per pound to get that chocolate color if you need it. So if you're using a more opaque wax, like a soy wax or um, any of the plant waxes, you can add a little bit of black to it to deepen it up too. So, all right, next question. How am I able to find the applications for blending two or more waxes? Example, 80% coconut brew and 20% beeswax. Then how do you find the fragrance oil from that? Okay, good question. So if you're blending waxes, Typically, most of the waxes don't take more than um, a 10% fragrance load anyway. If you're blending them, um, you can add the two fragrance loads together and then divide it out, um, divide by two, go with an average in there. Uh, but typically, they don't take more than that. So, all right. And then what do we have? Is it true that wax and fragrance oil never truly mixes the wax, just hardens around the fragrance? So, yeah, great question. So the scent molecules actually attach to the wax molecules. They don't change, right? Both are still the same. You still have scent molecules. You still have a wax molecules, but you want them to stick together and bond together. That's why it's very important to, to add the fragrance when the wax is warm. But yeah, it doesn't change. So like things that change, say, for instance, when you're making soap and you're using water and oils and lye and everything like that, all those things aren't the same. It saponifies and makes soap. If you're baking a cake, you're using, you know, flour, eggs, this, that. You don't have flour and eggs and everything all together at the end. You have a cake. Candles, you still have wax and you still have fragrance. Um, they're just stuck together and blended together. But so chemically, question. they don't really change. But. They do not, no. Okay. All right. Would you adjust? question I know kind of would you adjust accordingly example eight ounce jar with a fill rate of 120 grams 100 grams of wax and 20 grams of fragrance that would be a 20 percent fragrance load which is way too much fragrance load is based off your fill weight so 100 grams of wax 80 grams would be coconut brew and 20 grams of beeswax I think that was an answer to another question so is it possible for y'all to open on the weekend we're here I Saturday, drive. 9 to we 1. We are open on the weekend, yeah. <laughs> we're open on Saturdays from 9 to 1. So we're on holiday hours. Our holiday hours begin after Labor Day, the end of Christmas. So we are on holidays now. So um, so we are open Saturdays. So, yeah, that's possible. We are <laughs> doing it. Uh, thank you for the knowledge. Hello. I'm struggling trying to wick pillar candles. I'm mm -hmm. working with the goddess silicone mold. Aha. Okay. Easiest way to wick a pillar mold, especially a silicone mold is to by you know buy the wicking on the roll and then take the wicking off um you know pull the wicking out wick your mold 
right? But leave the roll of wicking off of the pillar, uh, outside of the mold. So every time you take the candle out, you'll pour the candle. And then when you take the you candle out, you just keep pulling the wick <laughs> up through. It's called auto wicking. And then you only have to wick it once. Um, to get it wicked the first time is kind of a pain. Usually I'll take a piece of floral wire, or I'll bend it into a V and then just thread the wick up. So stick it inside the mold, out the little hole, put the wick in the bottom and then pull it out. And that wicks the mold initially, but don't cut the wick. Just leave the roll of wicking on the end. That way when you pull your candle out, it's wicked for the next one and you never have to worry about that again. So, okay. Um, okay, great suggestion about pouring boiling water into a container to test its safety. Good, glad you like that. I keep hearing about Crisco. Can you explain? Okay, yeah. So Crisco is soy. So it's plant-based. So if you're using soy wax, coconut wax, whatever, um, what Crisco does is, especially if you have a harder burning candle, it just adds enough oil back in. So usually when it's harder burning, like the fragrance molecules may be clogging the wick, maybe some colors clogging the wick, something's clogging the wick, or it, it just doesn't want to burn. It's struggling. So adding Crisco just adds enough oil of the, the burning kind of oil back into your candle to get it to burn a little easier. So it's usually like one to two tablespoons per pound of wax gives you a completely different burn situation. So if you have, you know, if you've already tested your jars, you've tested your wick and wax with no fragrance, you add something like patchouli is a big offender. So um, patchouli is a very hard burning kind of fragrance. So you add patchouli and all of a sudden you have a little flame and it's tunneling down. You're like, what the heck? Add like two tablespoons of Crisco per, per pound of wax and it gets it to burn a whole lot easier. So just a little, um, little trick there. It's like a magic trick. So it's a candle making magic trick. All right. And then funny question. What makes you laugh? <laughs> okay, we'll skip that. So what makes me laugh is people that ask silly questions like that. So or just fun things. <laughs> um, what is the purpose of steric acid in the wax and also adding beeswax into the wax? Okay, both steric acid and beeswax both harden up the wax and, and lengthen the burn time. So again, if you have a fragrance that or a wax you like the wax and wick combo, but it just burns a little too fast for you. The flame's a little too high. You can add either beeswax, a little bit of beeswax, like 10% or less, um, or a little bit of steric acid. What that does is just make the wax a little harder and gets a, the burn to, to lengthen a bit. If you already have the perfect burn and stuff like that, and then you add it in there, it's going to get the candle to not burn as hot. So you may actually screw up your candle. So, but that's the purpose of beeswax and steric. All right, and then Steve, I'm struggling with the Cita Serica Cocoa Apricot Hot Throw. Yeah, we all have, and the temperatures um, for people say. Yeah, the Cita Serica is, is a beautiful wax. It makes a beautiful, beautiful candle and stuff like that, but the, the hot throw does struggle on that. So um, that's why we don't carry it. So we tested it and you know, I, I probably poured 20 candles out of it eight to 10 had a really nice scent for were really beautiful candles, but that's less than a 50% ratio. That's not good enough for us to add to our line. We want you, we only want to sell things where you're going to be successful with it. So it does make a beautiful one. We're working on um, a different formula of apricot wax that has a good scent throw all the time. So that may be up and coming within the next few months, which is super exciting because that does make a beautiful, beautiful candle and it's super easy to use. So um, one of the questions on Instagram was if you're required to collect PA sales tax, if you sell through Shopify. I don't know anything about that. If you have a nexus in PA, like you're operating business in PA and, and you're selling and stuff like that. So yes, theoretically, the state would love you to collect sales tax and remit it and everything like that. So um, I'm not exactly sure on Shopify's regulations, like if they make you have a sales tax license right up front or not, usually not. Um, you know, there's the hobby clause too, where if you're just selling a few candles and just starting out and it's mainly a hobby that, you know, they probably won't come after you. Yeah, um, I think it's under a certain dollar amount if you yeah, don't sell, right? Yeah, so, you know, once you get to where you're selling a decent amount of stuff and it's a viable business and stuff like that, yeah, definitely get your sales tax license and start remitting tax and stuff like that. But initially, if you're just starting out and selling a few things and, and testing the waters and market, um, I don't think you need to have it. It's not required by Shopify. We're also not lawyers, so. Yep, not, not lawyers, lawyers, not, not accountants. Legal advice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have my own tax planning advice that probably nobody should follow. So. <laughs> um, I don't don't listen to me. Or, or All right. Yeah, looks like we got some 
fun things going on out there. Do you like any coconut? So, yeah, I do. I like uh, all of our coconut waxes. I like, we have different blends. We have some with palm in it. We have some with paraffin in it. We have some with four. just coconut beeswax. Yeah, four, four or five. five. We do have a coconut yes. sampler kit to where it has like yeah. one pound of each of the waxes for you to try. That way you can test for yourself. They all do something a little differently. And it's like food. If you ask anybody what the best steak is, they'll be like, oh, T-bone, New York strip, porterhouse. You'll get all different answers. So it really depends on like how you like your candles and how you like them to burn and stuff. So, all right. And somebody, which wax is your favorite? That might be the number one question we get here. So, and it really depends on what I'm making. I mean, you know, I wouldn't pick a container wax for a pillar candle, that type wow. of thing. So if you're going, it depends on what you're making. Um, you know, if you want the wax to be shiny, if you want it to be matte, if you want it to be opaque, if you want it to be translucent, if you want it to be a single pour, if you want it to be soft or hard or whatever. So um, I like all of them in their own special way. It's kind of like, what's your favorite what a, kid? What a diplomatic answer. It is a diplomat, but it's true. Um, I do for like our candle classes and stuff like that. You know, when we have our candle making classes, I like our production single pour wax just because classes are active, a lot goes on and stuff. And I know that wax, it's like my best friend because it's, it's there for you no matter what makes a great candle, no matter what. So that's one of my favorites, but it doesn't mean I don't like the other waxes too. Um, yeah. Production single pour is my favorite too. It's the easiest to work with. I don't pay attention to temperature, but yeah, uh, it's always yeah. good. So. If you want to be super careless, I mean, you can even drink <laughs> wine and use that wax and everything turns out. All right. So yeah, yeah, that's a really good one. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Favorite hey. stark white shiny finish. That's easy. Product, uh, I'm assuming that's a shiny finish. I'm assuming that's for like a freestanding candle or a pillar candle. So that would be our production pillar blend. Makes a beautiful, beautiful, very shiny finish. Nice, nice outside. So, all right. And I think we're set for the questions. You guys can Sounds keep posting good. your questions. We'll answer them in there and everything too. Thank you for joining us today. This was fun. So I think in the upcoming weeks, we'll do a soap Q&A too. So if anybody makes soap and has any soap questions, we'll do that as well. But um, you guys had some great questions, great input. This was really awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you see next, next week, week for next week's live. Have a good day, Bye. everybody. Bye.